Welcome back, folks. <clears throat> These veterans I've been talking about, <clears throat> some of them have, well, they all have incredible stories. Some of them have done really heroic things. Some of them have saved a bunch of lives. Some of them have, you know, stormed hills. You, you name it. There's all kinds of different stories. <clears throat> but some of our veterans did things that are just unimaginable to most of us. Ken Cordier was in the, the Air Force. He served in he served two tours in Vietnam. <clears throat> flew out of <clears throat> excuse me, flew out of Udon, Thailand, did a bunch of missions over Laos and North Vietnam and uh, resigned for a second tour. Eventually completed 175 missions, which is a fairly significant number. <clears throat> December 2nd, 1966, he went on his 176th mission. And he was flying an F-4. And he was escorting another plane, I can't remember what kind, over North Vietnam and had his uh, co-pilot or his back seater with him. Suddenly he felt a thump on the plane. Gages started going crazy, he lost control of the stick wouldn't work. <clears throat> he quickly realized that he had been hit. He called to his guy in the back, said, we've been hit. He didn't understand what he said. He thought he said an expletive. You know, he thought something had gone wrong with the plane. And the guy in the back didn't realize the, the seriousness of the problem until he saw Ken fly out of the plane in his ejection seat. <clears throat> and then he followed suit. Ken, on the way down, they shot a second SAM, surface to air missile, at the plane. After he ejected, he saw the plane blow up. But the second Sam exploded. And as he was coming down in his ejection seat, he realized he was going to go right through the fireball that had been created from this explosion. And he did. He made it through that okay. He had some <clears throat> some minor burns, his hair, his, you know, his arm, stuff like that. And as he was coming down, he, he did something he wasn't supposed to do. He was supposed to ride that ejection seat to a low altitude and then deploy his parachute. For some reason, he panicked, got out of the ejection seat, pulled his parachute at a fairly high altitude. Well, the problem with that is it gives the enemy a lot of time to follow where you're going. He ended up landing in a rice paddy. <clears throat> Very quickly realized he was uh, in a bad neighborhood. People running at him with guns. So he threw his sidearm down and put his hands up. They came and took him captive and they also got his co-pilot. Uh, they tied him up, put him in a truck drove him up through North Vietnam over the course of the next 24 hours, stopping at all these little villages where people would mock him, throw things at him, spit on him, you name it. Stop at every little village. And the truck was an old, you know, probably either a Russian or a Chinese World War II type truck. Didn't have any suspension, so he was bouncing up and down along these roads. And he realized that he had a broken back. Probably from the force of the ejection. And so he was in severe pain. <clears throat> they finally got him up to an interrogation room. And if you've never heard these stories, these POW stories, about what they went through, there is absolutely no way I can convey that to you. I've read a bunch of them and they are all so consistent 
and what they talk about. I mean, they have little differences and special things that they had to do and that kind of thing. But overall, every one of them experienced the same stuff. And I'm going to put a link down in the description to a video interview that uh, Ken did and let you hear him tell it. And his version of this story compared to what I've read, it seems like he's watered it down to make it seem more palatable to people that are hearing it. Because he speaks around the country, tells tells his story all the time. And <clears throat> they can be somewhat overwhelming when you hear these stories. They're just absolutely brutality, unbelievable, you know, mercilessness, uh, torture, food deprivation, sunlight deprivation, they couldn't exercise, they couldn't talk, they couldn't, they had all these stupid rules they had to follow, and if they didn't, they would either get beat with a cane or get beat with a uh, fan belt off of a truck, they would get tied up, they would, they would call it, uh, I think they they call it putting them in the racks or the ropes, where they would they would literally take their arms, tie them behind their back, and cinch the ropes up so tight that their elbows were together behind their back. Try that. Try it right now. Try to get your elbows to touch each other. And they would leave them that way for hours. <clears throat> and in some cases, they would do that, and they would tie a rope around their neck and their feet, and bend them back so their head and their their head would be bent upward and their feet would bend up they were in like a hog tied position he had that done to him with a broken back he made the mistake of telling them he thought he had a broken back and that's what they concentrated on when they interrogated him but he was there from December 2nd 1966 until March 4th 1972 That's a long time. Actually, it was 73, because it was six years and a, and a couple, three months. So yeah, March 4th, 73 is when he was actually released. But go check out his video and just try to imagine what he's talking about. And you will gain if not a new respect for what these guys went through, at least maybe a better understanding of what they went through. And if you really want a deeper understanding of what they went through, there's about four or five books I can recommend that you could read that really goes into some gory details of what these guys put up with. And the thing that makes them all amazing to me is the fortitude the 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 fortitude that they had the mental toughness that they had their ability to look beyond where they were and what they were going through and concentrate on things that helped them to get through this they did some amazing things some unbelievably amazing things and um like i said some of these stories are about people storming hills some of them are about saving people's lives but there's so many things that our veterans went through that we may not be aware of that we may never know because if they don't tell the story, then we just, they keep it with them. But all of them went through something, every one of them. And I think it's important to understand specifically some of these POW stories to get a real good idea of what sacrifice means people die in combat and things like that that's the ultimate sacrifice people spend years away from their homes they do you know crazy physical things they do all kinds they lose limbs they, you know, there's a bunch of different ways that sacrifice can be denied can be defined but the POW stories to me speak to a level of sacrifice and what they went through in the service of our country <clears throat> and I think people need to hear it so if you're so inclined the interview's about an hour long it's well worth a watch and 
I'm going to put it down in the description. But, um, Ken, if you happen to see this, I, I have no words that could impart the thanks and the appreciation I have for what you've done. But on top of that, I'm incredibly sorry that you had to put up with what you had to put up with during your time in captivity and for the several years after your captivity and probably even st still to this day. Um, you're a man of honor. You deserve to be recognized. You deserve to be thanked. And thank you.